So there's a very interesting story about this particular topic. So when I was in fifth year, my first rotation was internal medicine. And so I was on the round and the consultant called me and said, young man, come over here. And he pointed at a woman's legs and she had these exact same lesions on her lower limbs. By then I had no idea what I was dealing with and I had no idea what it actually was. But looking back in retrospect, it was actually vitiligo. So let's talk about vitiligo. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is the series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at an important topic, vitiligo. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to receive your notifications of such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, show some support to Zambia and beyond. Let's go. Before I actually get into details of this topic, my girl and I actually had a very huge debate. And I, for one, say that this is vitiligo that's depicted on the picture. And she say that it isn't vitiligo. So please help us settle the debate and comment in the section below. And whether you agree with me, whether it's vitiligo or you don't agree with me that it's not vitiligo. And then we'll see who ends up winning in the end, I guess. So let's talk a little bit about the skin. Remember that the skin is largely divided into two main types. We have what is known as hairless skin, which doesn't have the hair strands. We also refer to this as thick skin, what you find on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Then on the other hand, you have what is known as hairy skin, which is found everywhere else in the body, which has hair. Now remember that the skin is going to be divided into layers. It's divided into the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue. I'm very much interested into the epidermis because remember that the epidermis is subdivided into more layers, histological layers. The epidermis is going to be divided into the basal layer, which is known as a stratum basali. Then after this, it's you have the stratum spinosum or the spinous layer. Then you have the stratum granulosum. Then you have the stratum lucidum. Then the stratum corneum is the most superficial layer. Now remember that 90% of the cells that you actually find in the skin are pretty much going to be made up of keratinocytes, which make keratin, which makes your skin waterproof. Then 10% of these cells are actually going to be melanocytes. And these are the ones that are going to be responsible for the pigmentation of the skin. Now remember that these melanocytes are going to be located in the basal layer of the skin, and they're going to be producing a pigment that's known as melanin in these elongated membrane-bound organelles, which we call melanosomes. Now remember that these melanosomes are going to be packaged and rather melanin is going to be packaged into these granules and then it's going to be moving across these dendritic processes and then this is going to be transferred by a process of phagocytosis to adjacent keratinocytes and that's how the entire skin actually pigments. Remember that melanin granules form a protective cap over the outer part of the uh, keratinocyte nuclei and this actually prevents uh, nucleic acid damage from ultraviolet radiation. So in the stratum corneum, there's actually this uniform distribution to form this UV absorbing blanket, which actually reduces the risk of radiation that's penetrating into the skin. Because remember that this radiation that is penetrating into the skin has the ability to actually cause skin cancer. So remember that the color of the normal skin actually depends on the mixture of these pigments. And untamed Caucasoid skin is actually pink, while it's, uh, it's going to be tinted from uh, white by oxyhemoglobin in blood within the dermis. Then, of course, the melanin blends with this color and may be increased, for example, after a suntan. So here's a picture of a uh, melanocyte. As you can see here, you have the melanosomes, which are these dark things here. Here you have this giant thing, that's the nucleus. This whole thing is a melanocyte. And then, of course, you have the keratinocytes there, or the keratin that is produced from the keratinocytes that's neighboring this melanocyte. Now, how exactly is melanin actually produced? Remember that melanin is going to be responsible for the different shades of brown, and it's not actually, not only in congoid or negroid type of skin, but it's also in other races. 
Remember that you have these various hues of color that are going to be caused by addition of these pigments to the yellow that you get from carotene, which is found mainly in the subcutaneous fat and the horny layer of the epidermis. Now remember that they, naturally there is no blue pigment and whenever you see a blue pigment, it's either due to an optical effect from the normal pigment, usually melanin in the dermis, or it's due to the presence of an abnormal pigment. The variations in ratio pigmentations are due to the differences in the melanocyte number. But uh, they are actually not, sorry, correction, they're not due to the differences in the melanocyte number, but they're going to be due to the differences in the size of the melanosomes that are actually produced. And also there are different types of melanin that we actually do produce in the body. I'll pass you through the mechanism. So remember that melanin is actually going to be formed from an essential amino acid that's known as phenyl, phenyl, phenyl alanine. Sorry, I'm very tired. Phenyl alanine, which is going to be through a series of these enzymatic series that are going to be happening in the liver. They're also going to be happening in the skin. Remember that this amino acid, phenyl alanine, is going to be converted to tyrosine. So in essence, tyrosine is like the precursor for melanin. And remember that this tyrosine is going to be formed in the liver by hydroxylation of the amino acid, which is the essential amino acid, phenylalanine, and this is going to be under the influence of the enzyme that's known as phenylalanine hydroxylase. This is the substrate for the reaction actually does occur in the melanocytes as well. And remember that in the melanocytes are the only cells in the epidermis that have tyrosinase, which is dopa oxid oxidase enzyme, the rate limiting step that actually is seen in the process of melanogenesis. Remember that then in the melanocytes, this tyrosine is going to be converted to doper. Then the doper is going to be converted to dopaquinon. Then in the presence of tyrosinase, this is going to be happening where you're converting the doper to dopaquinon and of course the tyrosine to dopa. Now remember that dopaquinon can be converted into two types of melanin. You have what is known as pheomelanin, which will give you a red yellowish type of hue by the addition of cysteine, or you can have eumelanin, which is giving you this brownish blackish type of hue. So remember that eumelanin and pheomelanin are pretty much going to be intermeshed to give you this uh, different forms of uh, melanin polymers. So here's a picture to show you that you, first of all, melanin synthesis is going to be stimulated by our melanocyte stimulating hormone. It's going to bind to this melanocortin receptor one, which is a CMP cascade, which is going to be stimulating tyrosine to be converted to dopa. Then dopa to dopaquinone, these reactions are catalyzed by tyrosinase. Then eventually you form this eumelanin, which is going to be having this brown black color and pheomelanin, which is going to be having this red yellowish color. And you can also have a mixture of this. Pheomelanin is going to be made into from dopaquinone by the addition of cysteine. Remember that the two types of melanosomes that are going to be there, you have eumelanosomes, which are going to be containing eumelanin, obviously. These ones are going to be long, longish in nature. They're going to be like a rugby ball. And you have the pheomelanosomes, which are going to be containing pheomelanin, and these are going to be spherical in shape. And remember that this melanin is going to be protecting against ultraviolet radiation damage, and it's going to be absorbing and scattering these rays, and also going to be scavenging the free radicals that are formed. Now remember that melano... Excuse me. Now remember that melanogenesis can actually be increased by several stimuli, the most important is this ultraviolet radiation. Remember that UV radiation mainly with a wavelength of about 290 to 320 nanometers, which is ultraviolet B, is going to be darkened in the skin. It's going to be doing this firstly by the process of photooxidation of the preformed melanin, and secondly, over a period of days, by stimulating now these melanocytes to produce this melanin. Then when you have the UV radiation, also it's going to be inducing keratinocyte proliferation, and this is going to result in, in thickening of the epidermis, which is why when you stay longer in the sun, you're going to appear darker. Then, of course, these melanocytes are going to be under the influence of melanocyte-stimulating hormone, which is produced from the pituitary gland and other parts of the brain. So having that background in mind, let's now talk about vitiligo. Remember that pigment loss from the skin can actually be generalized or patchy. Remember that generalized hypopigmentation is going to be occurring in conditions like albinism. I did a video on albinism. I'll leave it tagged here, you can actually click on it and go watch that video. Then it can also result from phenylketonuria or even hypopituitarism. 
You may also get this patchy loss that may be seen in vitiligo, what we're about to discuss, and after inflammation, following exposure to some chemicals, and even certain infections like leprosy, petriasis fasciculi. Then remember that the word vitiligo actually comes from the Latin word vitalis, meaning veal, meaning pale or pink flesh. So you describe it as this acquired idiopathic circumscribed depigmentation disorder, which is going to be showing these white non-scaly macules found in all races. If you don't know what macules are, again, I'll leave a card tagged here that you can go and click to actually look at the different skin lesions that I discussed. Remember that vitiligo is the most common pigment disorder and is going to be affecting about 0.5 to 1% of the world's population without any dis discrimination based on gender, age, location, or race. But most of the individuals that are going to be affected are going to be below the age of 20 and generally they experience a progressive increase in the depigmentation over time. Remember that the disease is multifactorial, but ultimately it's going to result in loss of the melanocytes. This can sometimes even be quite disfiguring. It can leave you with sun-sensitive skin, sometimes even with severe psychosocial distress, especially if it's quite extensive. There is an additional association with other autoimmune conditions such as pernicious anemia, thyroid disease, as well as Addison's disease. And this has been thought by many to suggest that vitiligo is actually associated with some underlying autoimmune process. In the pathophysiology, remember that we're not so sure what really causes this, and the pathophysiology is unclear, though many things have been implicated, but the endpoint of all these causes is going to result in melanocyte destruction. So it could be some genetic abnormalities, some autoimmune conditions, de dysregulation of the redox reactions, that's a reduction in oxidation reactions, or even some biochemical and neural pathways. But whatever the case is, remember that vitiligo is also considered as an autoimmune condition because of several reasons. One is because it's going to be associated with many other autoimmune disorders, such as autoimmune hypothyroidism, pernicious anemia, Addison's disease, as well as systemic lupus erythematosus. And also you get this elevated level of autoantibodies that are not just directed to the melanocytes, but also targeted against other organs, such as the thyroid, the gastric mucosa, the adrenal glands, and often we see these antibodies in patients that have vitiligo. Then you also have the cytotoxic T cells that infiltrate the active lesions, and of course, clearly implicating that this has an immune response in the disease process. Just like with many other disorders, there is no single pathway that actually is solely responsible for the causing of the vitiligo, but multiple pathogenic mechanisms actually have been implicated in the onset of the disease. Generally, the lesion is going to be happening quite sudden, but patients usually are going to report that this actually had a slow progressive expansion of these white spots on the skin without any other associated symptoms. The patient may actually even have a history of autoimmune disease in the family, and they may have a family history of vitiligo that may be present. Remember that sun exposure or trauma may actually draw attention to the lesion because the patients often are going to seek medical attention because of this. The sun, that area of the skin is actually becoming more sun sensitive. Then when you do your physical examination, remember that this presents as a well demarcated white macule, which is often symmetrical and of varying sizes and are often noted in five main patterns. But generally, you may have generalized vitiligo where a patient is going to be having this sharply bilaterally symmetrical white macules that are going to be present on the face, the body orifices, the trunk, the neck, and even extremities. They may be the back of the hand, the wrists, and even the front of the knees. And the hair and the scalp and the beers may sometimes be depigmented as well. Remember, this is the most common type of vitiligo and actually tends to present in the second decade. So patients usually will be between the age bracket of 20 to 30 years. Then the cause is rather unpredictable and the lesions may actually remain either static or sometimes they may spread. Sometimes they, this follows major trauma. We call that a Scobner syndrome. And occasionally they may actually repigment spontaneously coming from the hair follicle because the hair follicle is the only one that's going to be having some functional melanocytes, which will spread to the surrounding skin. Then there is a family history in 30% of the patient. And this type of vitiligo is actually most frequently associated with autoimmune diseases, such as diabetes, thyroid disorders, and pernicious anemia. It's actually postulated that in this type of vitiligo, you have these melanocytes that are target cells for the cell-mediated immune system attack. And they, you, you produce this self-destruction because of this inability to remove certain toxic melanin precursors. Then this can also be pre precipitated by trauma or sunburn. Then you also have a segmental pattern, which is going to be affecting one side of the uh, body or one single site. 
this one tends to occur much earlier than generalized vitiligo and it's not associated with uh, any autoimmune disease. It can be precipitated by trauma or sunburn and usually there's spontaneous repigmentation that's going to be occurring more often in this type of uh, vitiligo as opposed to generalized type of vitiligo. You may sometimes have an acral facial type of vitiligo, which is a third type. This is generally going to be affecting the lips, the perioral areas, as well as the hands and the feet. You may also have it being universal, which is the fourth type, which is often going to be involving over 50% of the body surface area over a wide distribution. It often is going to be having this mixed pattern where you're going to have this combination of generalized segmental or even acrofacial patterns and the macules are non-scaly. Remember that they're going to be accentuated by Wood's lump examination. Remember that often lesions are often very symmetrical, but they may occur anywhere where there's a peculiar predilection for circumferential involvement of the orifices, for example, the face, the upper chest, and even sites of pressure. Hair and the mucous membranes also may be affected, and only rarely are the borders erythematous or the borders will become hyperpigmented. So here's a picture of a person who has the symmetrical involvement of vitiligo, which is actually quite extensive. There are no routine labs that we can actually do to make a diagnosis, but patients may actually have evidence of thyroid disease or other autoimmune conditions where you may want to order certain labs, such as an anti-nuclear antibodies. You may also order for liver enzymes, urea, electrolytes, and creatinine. When you actually get a histological sample of the skin, vitiligo is actually going to show you that in those areas that are affected, you don't have any melanocytes in the affected skin, although uh, you may sometimes see some degenerating melanocytes, especially in the border of the lesions. Then conversely, you may actually have normal melanocytes that are seen in clinically non-affected skin, but the keratinocytes may actually appear abnormal. They may actually have this extra cellular granular material or vacuolated cytoplasm in the basal layer. Diagnosis is often based on clinical appearance, as well as the distribution of the lesion, the chronicity of the condition, the progressive involvement and the lack of associated symptoms, and also with exclusion of other conditions that may mimic vitiligo. Our differential diagnosis is going to be tinea vesicular, which may be differentiated by the presence of these fine scales. Sometimes you get a positive potassium hydroxide test, and the distribution is primarily on the trunk and the neck. You may have pityriasis alba, which is a relatively common condition, especially in children that have atopy, and you may get these fine scales, but often these lesions are going to retain some pigmentation and it's less sharply demarcated as opposed to vitiligo. Then you may sometimes get this post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, which is often associated with trauma or inflammation of the affected skin, and the area will be uh, preceded uh, this inflammation will be preceding the loss of the pigmentation in that area. Then you may also sometimes get lep leprosy. Remember, sometimes leprosy must be excluded. You should do a sensory test in the area and also a general examination to rule out leprosy. Now, in our management, remember that the rate of spontaneous repigmentation is quite low. About 20% of the time, it's going to repigment, but usually even the repigmentation is rather incomplete. Treatment is unsatisfactory, and in white patch pigmented cells, are actually only present only in the deep hair follicles such that when you treat these patients, the repigmentation will actually happen from those hair follicles and then spread to the affected skin. Such that when you get this repigmentation, you get this freckled-like appearance of the follicles then uh, within the patches. Then, of course, recent patches actually tend to respond much better to the treatment than the older patches. So you may sometimes use potent or even very potent topical corticosteroids, which can be applied for one to two months. Then after this, you can actually reduce the strength of the corticosteroids and gradually, gradually taper them off to a mild uh, potent uh, steroid for maintenance treatment. Alternatively, you can actually give them immunosuppression drugs to actually quiet down the immune system, especially if there's some autoimmune contribution and if the stimulation of melanocyte or melanin production actually counteracts the progressive loss of the melanocytes. Then topical corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, maybe 0.1% or 0.02% for the genital areas, tacrolimus ointment, uh, permicrolimus cream, vitamin D supplementations have all been used to actually improve vitiligo, but these are going to be working by affecting the immune system locally. Remember that calcineuria is actually a calcium and carmodulin-dependent uh, serine or uh, 309 protein phosphatase, and it actually activates T cells of the immune system. So if we actually inhibit this, then we actually cripple the immune system. Then these treatments can actually be combined with other modalities such as phototherapy with exposure to natural sunshine 
or artificial ultraviolet A. A narrow band of 311 nanometers, um, ultraviolet B can also be effective. Then the therapy is usually done two to three times a week for at least six months. And the new lesions, like I said earlier on, tend to respond much better than the older lesions. Melanocytes and stem cell transplants can sometimes be done in which like you get these single cell suspensions that are made from the uninfected skin and then they apply to the skin that has vitiligo and then this is still under a lot of investigation. But generally, as a rule of thumb, uh, established vitiligo is best left untreated in most white people, although the advice about suitable camouflage preparations to cover up this unsightly patch, quote unquote, can be given to them. For example, they can have staining with dihydroxyacetone self-taining lotions, or they can cover it up with theatrical makeup. Sun avoidance and also using of sun uh, screening preparations, such as uh, creams that have uh, sunscreen protection factor, are actually needed to avoid any sunburn in that affected area, and a heightened contrast, because once you are exposed to the, uh, the sun, the surrounding area is going to be much darker, and then that part will be like appearing much paler than the surrounding skin. So for those darker individuals with actually extensive vitiligo, they may actually undergo complete or sometimes irreversible complete depigmentation with certain creams such as monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone. But of course, this has certain social implications and these must be discussed with the patient and carefully considered before the patient actually gives written consent that they can actually undergo the treatment and they can completely depigment their entire skin. I really hope you enjoyed this video on vitiligo. Sorry about my voice, I'm still having a cold. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Don't forget to comment below so that you can settle our argument. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.